Well, good morning. As we get started, I'm going to read a Psalm of David. Uh, this is Psalm 72, verses 1 through 7. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. May they fear you while the sun endures, and as long as the moon throughout all generations, may he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may, may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. Let's sing together.
Take a seat. Good morning, church. My name is uh, Pastor Brian Metz. Um, I'm one of the pastors here at We're the Redeemer. If we haven't met, I would love to meet you. Um, we now enter into our time of pastoral prayer and scripture reading this morning. Uh, the Crow family will be reading our scriptures in just a bit. And so if uh, y'all want to make your way up here as I'm praying, that would be great. Uh, well, uh, as we are into the swing of Christmas season... And Advent is upon us. Uh, it is uh, wonderful to, uh, to gather with the saints on the Lord's Day. 
um, as we head into our Christmas season and time to celebrate the incarnation of Christ. Um, I'm reminded uh, this morning as we sing, as we sang this last song of uh, yesterday evening's festivities with Rhythms of Grace uh, Dance Academy and Dance Studio. I'm not sure exactly how to say that. I probably botched that completely. Uh, but my daughter is a, a student there. We have, I think, almost the whole entire almost the whole entire leadership that comes to our church. So uh, we're trying to get the others to come too, right? Kristen and Celeste and Jessica. We're trying to hook in those other ones. But they put on a tremendous performance. The, little, the littles were always fun to watch, and uh, it was a special, a special time. Um, if you haven't ever checked out Rhythms of Grace's dance recitals or pr- presentations that they do, uh, I highly recommend it because they go to our church, and we should support them. They have a wonderful ministry there, and uh, yeah, you should do that. All right, that's a little little impromptu shout-out to them because they're doing some amazing stuff in the community. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are Emmanuel, God with us, that you sent your son Jesus to come and be a little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger uh, as it's been prophesied, Lord. We, uh, we rejoice in that. We rejoice that you... Uh, saw fit to set aside your uh, excellency, your, your kingship to come and uh, clothe yourself in our humanity to walk among us. And so, Lord, even this morning as uh, our pastor or our, our preacher this morning is, is Steve Mitwitty, I pray, Lord, that you would anoint him with your spirit this morning, that Father Steve would come and deliver to us uh, the message of peace this morning. God, we thank you so much for uh, the message of hope found in the gospel, the message of peace found in the gospel, the message of joy, the message of love found in the gospel, the good news of Jesus coming to earth to walk among us as a man. So Lord, we we rejoice in that this morning. God, we come worshiping as saints this morning. Um, uh, We come worshiping with broken hearts. Some of us come worshiping this morning with hearts filled with with the promise of peace and joy. And so, Lord, we come this morning acknowledging that Jesus is King and Jesus is Lord. Um, Father, may you make this reality true in our hearts and our homes and in our community this holiday season. Oh, God, uh, may our hearts be uh, shaped and pointed and the eyes of our hearts open to you and the reality of King Jesus. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Crows. Good morning. Uh, Today I'll be reading Isaiah 11, uh, verses 1 through 10. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with his breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious.
And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the, an and the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will, will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Hebrews 4, uh, 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Dateline, November 4th, 2022, Buderim, Queensland, Australia. A reptile wrangler was summoned to an Australian home where a resident discovered the cause of a moving microwave was a pair of mating pythons. A video posted to Facebook shows Stuart McKenzie of Sunshine Coast Snake Catchers responding to a home in Buderim, where a woman discovered two carpet pythons in the throes of passion in her kitchen. The snake catching business said the woman noticed her microwave had moved and looked behind it to find the pair of mating snakes. We were able to get there very quickly and re relocate the two lovebirds back out into the bush where they belong, the post said. A moved microwave, an effect for which there was a cause, and cause there was. But this isn't terribly important news. Vastly more significant news is a great effect, and there's a great effect that's available to us. Salvation has been secured, one that grants hope and peace and joy and love, and there is one definite, impeccable cause, the promised Messiah. I carefully and intentionally chose the word impeccable in that it comes from the Latin word impeccabilis, which means not liable to sin. Jesus was not liable to sin, but in Adam's original sin, Humans lost the power not to sin and gained and now retain the power to sin, which we continue to exercise, at least sometimes. And in case you've ever bristled at the biblical teaching of original sin, just remember that you sin either by omission or commission every day, maybe every hour possibly every minute or two, if not in your actions, in your thoughts, or in your words, or in your attitudes. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. And you would too if you were honest. Our first point today is simple. 
embracing revelation. Christians are a people who not only believe that there's a triune God, but that that triune God has chosen to communicate with his creatures, even fallen and rebellious as we are. He does that specially through Jesus Christ, the living word, and in scripture, the written word of God. In a general way, he communicates through the book of nature. I'm a science teacher. I talk about the book of nature all the time. Of the book of nature, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith says this, although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God, so much that man is left without any excuse, they are not sufficient to provide that knowledge of God and his will, which is necessary for salvation. Even though the heavens declare the glory of God, the heavens, nor any other wonder, neither the heavens nor any other wonder in the created order is enough for a person to be saved from sin and death. We have people in our midst who study the human body, who help people to heal. We have people who are scientists, engineers, who study the atom, who study cells. I like to look at rocks and minerals. And although these things amaze me, they're not sufficient for me to understand that there's salvation in Christ. They allow me to know that there is a powerful God who is at work. But that wonder that I have about their created order will never be enough to rescue me. Amazingly, our good God has condescended and accommodated himself to us, choosing to communicate in human language, illumined by the Spirit to reveal his character, plan, and purposes. Again, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith is helpful. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life, is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in Holy Scripture. This is the second of three times that I'm going to refer to the Baptist Confession of Faith. Now, the Baptist Confession of Faith is not inerrant. It's not the Word of God, but it gives us a beautiful summary of what the Bible teaches about important things, specifically about God's revelation. Now, if you're like me, you would probably say that there are some things that are hard to stomach in the Bible. Things that are hard to understand in the Bible. But that situation in no way detracts from God's reputation, nor from his ability to communicate with us. But instead, just reflects our finitude. We are limited. It reflects our fleshliness. We are given to sin. And it reflects our limited frame of reference. We don't see the way that God sees. We don't see everything that God sees. Again, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith un unpacks this succinctly. All things in Scripture are not equally plain in themselves nor equally clear to everyone. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and revealed in some place of Scripture or other that not only the educated but also the uneducated may attain a sufficient understanding of them by the due use of ordinary means. I'm reminded here of Renaissance man, Dutch theologian, Abraham Kuyper. Abraham Kuyper did a doctorate in theology at the University of Leiden. And in his first pastorate, he was engaging, as pastors do, in pastoral visitation. And he went to the home of a, an old woman in the village. And she said to him, you do not give us the true bread of life. 
this is a big wig theologian, a guy who had done his doctorate in theology at the University of Leiden, and she said, you don't give us the true bread of life. You see, even though he had done a doctorate in theology, Abraham Kuyper was not a saved man. But because of that old village woman who spoke boldly to her pastor, he understood the gospel and his life was changed. Now, you may have never heard of Abraham Kuyper, but he founded a political party. He became the prime minister of the Netherlands. He founded the Free University of Amsterdam. He founded and edited a newspaper. This is a Renaissance man whose life was changed by an uneducated person who knew God's revelation. One class of scripture that can be challenging for us, maybe especially challenging for us, limited as we are, is prophecy. Yet it's critical that we dig into it. For it, for it is in prophetic words, and especially messianic prophecies, that we get some of the clearest truths about the promised Savior. Theologian Lewis Matthew Sweet described prophecy in this way. Prophecy is history enfolded. History is prophecy unfolded. You've probably heard that phrase, history is his story. Prophecy is history enfolded. History is prophecy unfolded. I just came across this yesterday, you know, social media feeds and whatnot, a quotation from Owen Strand. So many wish to hear the voice of God, so few read the Bible, his declared revelation. Sort of mind-boggling, isn't it? God speaks, he gives us his voice, and we leave it on the shelf. Christianity's firm teaching on divine revelation is the hallmark, the first foundation of our faith. Our second point is this, reading backwards helps us to read properly and fully. Reading backwards helps us to read properly and fully. In his 2014 book, Reading Backwards, Richard B. Hayes sets forth an approach to scripture that is incredibly encouraging, logically satisfying, and biblically faithful. Of this approach, he writes, a gospel-shaped hermeneutic, if you don't know the word hermeneutic, that just means interpretive method. A gospel-shaped hermeneutic necessarily entails reading backwards, reinterpreting Israel's scripture, the Old Testament, in light of the story of Jesus. Such a reading is a figural reading, a reading that grasps patterns of correspondence between temporally distinct events so that these events freshly illuminate each other. This means that for the evangelists, here he's talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the meaning of the Old Testament text was not confined to the human author's original historical setting or to the meaning that would have been grasped by the original readers or hearers. Rather, Scripture is a complex body of text given to the community by God who had scripted the whole biblical drama in such a way that it had multiple senses. Some of the senses are hidden so that they come into focus only retrospectively. We say it all the time, don't we? Hindsight is 2020. More specifically, Scripture is to be interpreted in light of the cross and the resurrection. Yes, it's exactly these two major events, the cross and the resurrection, that make sense of the whole, that allows enfolded history to be unfolded by the prophecies about the Messiah. So we're going to read a bunch of these prophecies. You see, the Bible doesn't get anything wrong. I might get things wrong. 
the Bible won't get things wrong. So we're going to look at a lot of Scripture. So we're going to go way back to the book of Genesis. And in Genesis 49, we see these words. Now, the, the words that I hope are projected on the screen here are where Jacob, also called Israel, is blessing his 12 sons before his death. And to Judah, he says this, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Did Jacob know what he was talking about? I doubt he fully understood what, what these words fully meant. But as we look at the New Testament and we read backwards, we understand that this is the, a mention of the one who would come out of Judah who would be the ruler, the ruler. From Numbers 24, we see this verse. You remember Balaam, the guy who had the donkey that talked to him? This is just kind of woven into the book of Numbers. But look what it says. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush, crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. A star out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. See, we see the scepter again, not only in Genesis 49, but here in Numbers 24. I want to make one aside here. I don't know about you, but is there anyone else who's jazzed by the fact that God is willing to repeatedly be identified as a God of Jacob? Jacob was decidedly undesirable. He was the sort of stereotypical, and my apologies in advance for anyone who does a faithful job of selling used cars. He's sort of the stereotypical used car salesman of the Old Testament. But God redeems even the lowest, the most undesirable, even pariahs and outcasts. That's good news. Let's look at some other things that God revealed about the promised Messiah back in the Old Testament. From Micah 5, we see these words. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. An image of warfare, of conflict. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth one shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. This tells us something about the person of this one who will come. He will be a ruler. And there's a key to his identity. This is one who is of old, from ancient of days. Verse 3, therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. Didn't we see something like that back in... Genesis, that people would bring tribute. But finally in verse 5, and he shall be their peace. In Zechariah 9, we see these verses. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble 
and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Before I go on, does that sound familiar? Of course, this is a prophetic picture of Jesus' triumphant entry, as explained in the accounts in the four Gospels. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Do you ever have seasons that lack peace in your life? Does peace sound appealing? We'll dig into that more in just a moment. Let's look at Malachi 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when tall the arrogant and tall evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. This is a picture of divine wrath. But hard on the heels of that, in verse 2, it's a picture of divine grace. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. I don't think we've sung it yet this year, but you remember the Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. These words are used in that hymn. The Son of Righteousness risen with healing in his wings. It's a beautiful image of calves leaping out of stalls. Of all of that energy constrained and now jumping forth. I wonder how often on a Monday morning when we head to the office or to the hospital, to the factory, to the plant, to the study, are we leaping like calves from the stall, recognizing what has been won for us by our great Savior? Let's look at Isaiah 9. And we saw this last week uh, when Pastor Brian spoke. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. I don't know about you, but when I see of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. That's hard for me to get my mind around. It's like, don't you kind of reach a state of peace and then you have it? But it says here that of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. There's going to be a growing, a filling out that amazes. Now to Luke chapter 1. Of course, this is in the New Testament, but it's sort of an Old Testament sort of prophecy. This is Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and his words are recorded for us. And again, it beautifully ties together the past of the Old Testament with what's happening in the New Testament in the gospel accounts. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets of old. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promise to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. In holiness and righteousness before him all our days. 
And you, child, he's talking about John the Baptist, will be called prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of God, whereby the sunrise, think what we just saw in Malachi, where the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is talking about our Savior. This is Jesus. Now, there are two main ways that peace is used in the New Testament. There's one, peace that's an inner calm, that's a lack of anxiety, sort of a settledness. But there's also peace that has to do with a cessation of conflict, a removal of enmity between warring sides. And I would say that actually the latter, the removal of enmity, is what makes the former possible. The settledness, the, the calm, the lack of anxiety is only possible once that warring has been dealt with. But I don't think we have to get hung up on this piece or that piece because what God has in view is shalom. And that's not just some hippie word peace man. See, most of you are too young to remember that. I remember that. You know, people going around and... But shalom envisions human flourishing, wholeness, completeness, soundness, health, safety, prosperity. This is a comprehensive peace that spans every facet of human existence. There are two important things here. First, God's preferred future is the future that will be. What God wants to have happen will happen. Second, it involves his people becoming fully what they were created to be. That's the fullness of shalom. For you, for me, to become what he intends for us to be in fullness. I told Pastor Wade I was uh, happy that he wore his, his sweatshirt today. Could you stand up so everybody, you can model this? Okay. We did not coordinate. Yeah, look at that. Look, he knows how to pose. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Wade, don't look for a job in Paris, but it is a great sweatshirt. And the reason I'm having him show you the sweatshirt is because the person who's pictured on the sweatshirt is Athanasius, that great father of the church, who was, who was really the key individual that God used to clarify our understanding of the God-man, Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. In his great book on the incarnation, he wrote this, the supreme object of his coming was to bring about the resurrection of the body. This was to be a monument to his victory over death. It is no exaggeration to say that Jesus came to die. But he also came to live again so that we might live. His victory came on the cross, as inapparent as that may have seemed. Think of the gospel accounts. When Jesus died on the cross, were his followers jumping up and down? He won! <laughs> no. But the empty tomb was the vindication, the ultimate proof of his victory over sin and death. He defeated sin and death on the cross. But that was vindicated. His victory was proven with his resurrection. And with that victory over sin and death, there was the removal of enmity between us and God. And between us. Between you. Between us. Between you. I'm pointing at some couples here. The enmity. You ever, ever have any enmity? We had some yesterday. 
My wife just kind of smiled and squinted her eyes. <laughs> Guess what? The provision has been made. That is good news. Almost every time I get up here, you'll hear me quote 2 Peter 1.3. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Everything. Everything we need for life and godliness is ours. More on that later. Third point, God's doing is rooted in his being. There is nothing arbitrary, nothing done on a whim in God's plan. We may not always understand hard happenings or painful events in our lives. I've had some. But the triune God is not capricious. He's neither random nor is he wishy-washy. And he's also not subject to our limited view of things, to our reason to our preferences or prerogatives, thankfully. He knows what is truly best for our ultimate good and for his own eternal glory. He can be counted on specifically because his doing is rooted in his peerless being. We don't use that word a lot, peerless. God has no peer. There is no one like God. Even St. Brian here. I know that's hard to believe. The Lord God, Yahweh, is the only self-existent, non-contingent being in the universe. That means he has been and always will be. That means he has no needs, no weaknesses, no shortcomings, and no flighty desires. And so far as we're naturally helpless and wayward, wouldn't we want a rescuer who can actually help? One who not only knows, but also shows the right way. And who can empower us to live in that way. This isn't pull us out of the miry clay and say, good luck. That's not what this salvation is about. Hallelujah, Old Testament expectations have given way to New Testament fulfillments. And that includes, but is not limited to, the work of the Holy Spirit in us. In the Old Testament, the Spirit was available for temporary empowering. But what we see in the New Testament as is permanent indwelling of all in the household of faith. Remember what I said from 2 Peter 1.3 a moment ago? His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. He's given us himself. The Spirit dwells in God's people. This is not sola bootstrapa. Last time I was up here, I used that phrase. This is not about us pulling ourselves up by our spiritual bootstraps. This is about God rescuing and then coming to dwell in his people so that they can live in his way. But I'm reminded of that verse in Colossians 1, where Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This isn't, here, I've rescued you, now go and try to work it out. That's like, here, I'll pull you out of the clay and now I'll dump you back in. In Christ, the Spirit is given to permanently indwell all in the household of faith. And the Spirit delights in not only guiding God's people, but in graciously strengthening them in every circumstance. I want to mention Isaiah 53 here. We know this passage about the suffering servant. And of course, we understand this to be a messianic prophecy. But I love it because it does mention our topic, peace. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, 
we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Can I have a witness? American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, one of my favorites, once wrote, we judge ourselves by what we're capable of doing while others judge us by what we have already done. In either case, we come face to face with condemnation. We judge ourselves harshly, often even more than others might. Am I the only one who does that or do others judge themselves? Remember I was teaching in Russia some years ago and I had this student, her name is Ophelia, and she said, you know, the really hard thing is not accepting his forgiveness, it's forgiving ourselves. And I think there's a lot to that. of really applying, of taking, and applying to our own lives that forgiveness, that provision, that acceptance. I, for one, am thankful that there's no longer condemnation for those who are in Christ. You may know the, that verse, Romans 8.1. Moreover, what's really important now is not what we're capable of doing, but what he in us is capable of doing. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's look at Titus 3. I think his words are incredibly clarifying. The other passage from Titus, Pastor Brian uh, shared with us last week. But this is one of those other great ones. This is you know, the kind that you've got to memorize. I'm sorry I haven't, but this is the memorized kind. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works we have done in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. People, that's good news. I don't know what you came for today. This is good news. No doubt is left here. We don't and can't make peace. We can't earn our salvation. Look at the description in these verses. Look at the description of the pre-saved person. And then the clear de declaration that he does the saving and not because of our righteous works. Why? Because our works aren't worth diddly. I actually had written down here diddly squat, but I don't know if people say that anymore. <laughs> Do people say diddly squat anymore? They're not worth diddly. Everything's shorthand these days. In this context, Isaiah 64, 6 has to be mentioned. It says, all our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Do you all know that verse? Isaiah 64, 6? Do you know that the Hebrew word that's translated there, idda, literally means the bodily fluids from a woman's menstrual cycle? Can we say that on a Sunday morning? That's what this is about. Filthy rags. That's what it's talking about. Look it up. You don't have to believe me. That's what, that's what our righteous deeds measure up to. But then there's that great but, one of the great buts of the New Testament. Because of his mercy and grace and the mighty work of the Spirit, we are made right by the Savior. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of my favorite verses, and I do have this memorized. God made him who knew no sin become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The great exchange. God made him who knew no sin become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
that which separated us from God was demolished by Christ's perfect sacrifice. And true peace was won for us by him. Friends, if you have not forsaken all other paths, all other means of trying to measure up, hear what's available to you. This hope and peace are actually the birthright of all who are in Christ. Would you receive it if you have not? Finally, we're going to look at Ephesians 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Did you hear what that said? A dwelling place for God. You remember in the Old Testament, the tabernacle and later a temple God doesn't want a tent. He doesn't want a marble building. He wants to dwell in his people. That's fantastic news. That's the reality of what we celebrate. Emmanuel, God with us. Mind-boggling, fantastic news. So I have four practical steps for us to move forward. The first is this, delve into Revelation. I don't mean the book of Revelation, I'm talking about God's revelation to us. And learn to delight in it. And in Him. And learn to read backwards. Allow the gospel accounts to inform your reading of the Old Testament. Don't neglect the Old Testament. Remember in Luke 24, where Jesus is, meets these guys walking on the road to Emmaus? Do you remember what he did there? It says in Luke 24, 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The Old Testament was the only Bible that Jesus had, that Paul had, that Peter had. We can't neglect the Old Testament. We can't say, oh, it's hard. What? It's all about Jesus. We gotta dig in. Second, we need to desist from looking for more. Jesus is enough for hope and peace and joy and love. Learn to dig into and dwell in the richness of life in Christ. If you need help in this, talk to me, talk to your pastors. Third, Dwell on the unity with God and with all in the church that is yours in Christ. And demand of yourself and others a commitment to preserving unity in the body of Christ. This is what we do to preserve peace that's won for us by Christ. One great way to do that is not to engage in gossip. You say, oh, I don't do that. I never do. Let me tell you something. If you're talking with someone about something that you're neither a part of the problem nor a part of the solution, you're gossiping. If you're not part of the problem 
or part of the solution, and don't make yourself feel good like I'm always a part of the solution. You're not. That's gossip. One of the great things that we do in the Lord's Supper, one of the great things that we should be celebrating is the unity that we have not only with our Savior, but with one another. And that's a reason that if we've got issues with somebody, we don't just take the Lord's Supper. We go and we take care of business. Some writings from the early church actually told, tell us that in the second century that they made a habit of doing that on Saturday night, of going and taking care of business. If you've got anything against anyone, they went and took care of things. That should be our habit. And lastly, define your life the way that God does in Christ, never forgetting his provision is confirmed by his presence. The spirit of Christ dwells in you if you've trusted that Jesus is the only way of salvation. Paul Tripp calls this identity amnesia, when we forget who we are in Christ. Do you ever forget who you are in Christ? Do you ever forget the resources that are available to you? My goodness, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. What better provision could you ask for? His provision is his presence and his power, his resurrection power. Delve into his revelation. Desist from looking for more. Dwell on unity. Define your life the way that God does. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the great news that shows us that we have been rescued. Not just pulled from miry clay, but our feet have been set on a rock and you've put a new song in our mouths. May we sing that to the glory of King Jesus. And it's in his name we pray, amen.
a doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father. Before we leave this morning, I have our parting scripture from Romans uh, chapter 15, verses 5 through 7. I'm going to read verses 5 and 6 if you'll join in with me in reading verse 7 together. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Amen. You are dismissed.